You're listening to the Hog Sports Network Daily Podcast. Now, here's your host, Matt Jones. And happy Tuesday to you. We appreciate you being here. Hope you had a great Labor Day weekend. Am I the only one who thinks it's Monday? I, I was writing stuff out this morning, and I kept writing Monday, Monday, Monday. And it, I don't know, it's kind of weird. It, it feels like a Monday, but it's a Tuesday. Those yeah. are always fun weeks. It's I don't know what day it is. It's throwing me off that Arkansas has it had its season opener on a Thursday mm-hmm. because that made Thursday feel like a Saturday. But then yesterday, I don't know what yesterday was. You sound like Sam Pittman when he's describing some of these game weeks. He goes, you know, a Tuesday is a Monday and a Wednesday is a Tuesday. Yeah. And I, I, it could be you could throw out any day of the week for me right now, and that's what it is. Did, I wonder what are your 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 thoughts from college football opening weekend. We talked about the Razorbacks game on Thursday. They beat UAPB 70 to nothing. We're on to Cincinnati, as Bill Belichick would say, on to Oklahoma State. But, like, the other thoughts from opening weekend. I don't know about you, Ethan, but the perception of a lot of different teams has changed for me. And some of that might be a little bit of over, overreaction. And you know, I heard somebody say one time, you don't overreact to week one games. You observe them. Mm-hmm. Uh and I think that's a good you know piece of advice. But I think LSU looks beatable. I think Texas A&M looks beatable. Obviously, they lost over the weekend to good teams, Southern Cal and Notre Dame, but they're going to play good teams in the SEC too. And I think a lot of times what we do is that we hype up these teams in our mind during the summer and say, oh, just because they have a number attached to the side of their name, LSU was number 13, Texas A&M was number 20, and that obviously means that they're the better team. That's not necessarily the case. Mm-hmm. I think the transfer portal, and I mentioned this the other day a little bit, it has changed things to, to such an extent that you don't know what kind of team you're going to have. Look at Florida State. They're the number 10 team in the preseason. They look like the number 10 team to you? <laughs> no. If, no. You're, if you were able to watch them, if you weren't a DirecTV uh, subscriber, uh, you, they did not look very good against Boston College last night. And it feels like everybody's a Florida State uh uh, a Florida State expert right now because they played in two exclusive broadcast windows. They played that game in Ireland when it was the only game on TV, and then they played the game on Labor Day. And so, like, not only have they not played well, but they have not, they've laid it out there for the entire college football world to see that they that they are not a very good team. But just because a team is ranked doesn't mean they're very good. Arkansas was a top ten team in 2012, and look how that season turned out. I feel different about Arkansas' schedule right now than maybe I did two weeks ago after you know the proof is there because, again, just because you're ranked doesn't mean you're an elite team. Georgia is. Uh, Texas, they look like they probably are. They, they both look great over the weekend. Uh, but uh, I, just, I, I, I feel different about this season after a week, and maybe I'll feel different next week after they play Oklahoma State but I feel different right now. Yeah, I think you're right on how, you know, it's only been one week, but it already kind of changes your, you know, perception of your schedule for a lot of teams. For instance, Missouri, all we've talked about with them, I think leading into the season was how easy that schedule is and how it's designed to make the playoff. But now you look at weeks three and four and you're, you've got Boston College and Vanderbilt, which all of a sudden, I mean, those teams haven't really proven too much, but they've at least proven that they're probably better than they were a year ago. They've got two of the better wins of the season, I would think, at this point, just because a lot of teams hadn't played anybody, right? Yeah. We'll talk about that. I didn't mean to interrupt but, you. Oh, no, you're good. And I think that for Arkansas, you know, you're still looking at that schedule, and you're it's it's still a monster, but you you saw what Texas A&M has, and of course, they'll be better by the time Arkansas plays them, probably, but you know that it's not like you're going up against an offensive juggernaut, probably. <laughs> and then LSU, you probably feel a little bit better about that, too. I think it just kind of changes maybe a little bit of um, perception, at least as far as makes it not look as daunting, at least for the Razorbacks. I just don't think we know a lot about a lot of teams just yet. Florida State, I think we know a lot about them because they played two power conference teams. But you think about what the SEC did in, in week one. I mean, blowout after blowout after blowout. What a weak slate of opening weekend games. There were a few good ones in there. I mean, LSU played USC. Who knew Vanderbilt, Virginia Tech was going to be a good game? Yeah. Uh, Georgia and Clemson. I mean, Georgia kind of did what Georgia does, which is they just bludgeon you and then they just suck the life out of you. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's that's kind of what they did to them. 
uh, what what else did we have on opening weekend? We had, well, you had A&M, Dominion, Notre Dame. Old Dominion almost beating well, South Carolina. That wasn't Carolina. supposed to be a good one. Well, we'll, it, we'll it talk ended about up that being a good one. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that. You got Notre Dame and uh, A&M. That was a good game. Came down to the very end. And you had Miami, Florida, and, and Florida looks like they're they're toast. Their yeah. they're coaching staff, I don't know that they're going to make it uh, through this season, especially not after Billy Napier made some comments about uh, Central Florida rural basements or something on Monday. Yeah. I can't remember exactly what he said. I know that it's uh, when you start when you start getting personal with the fans. That to me is always kind of a an alarming sign that the uh, <clears throat> that the end may be near. But look at some of these matchups: the F- FCS versus FCS matchups on Week One ended with an average final score of 66 to 2. That's not a typo. 66 to 2. I mean just g- consider this. Tennessee played Chattanooga on Saturday and Tennessee won that game 69 to 3 Ethan and it was the third closest game of the weekend between an SEC team and an SCS team. Uh, other scores Arkansas beat UAPB obviously 70 to nothing. Uh, that game was shortened by 10 minutes. None of these others were shortened like that one. Otherwise, Arkansas may have had the biggest win. Ole Miss beat Furman 76 to nothing. I kept watching that score, you know, update across the bottom of whatever game I was watching. And I kept thinking, man, they're going to score 80, 90 points. And I guess they, they took it easy in the fourth quarter. Uh, Auburn beat Alabama A&M 73 to three. Mississippi State beat Eastern Kentucky 56 to seven. And Missouri beat Murray State 51 to nothing. I don't know what any of these teams know about their teams other than the fact that they can beat the snot out of somebody who's not anywhere near their level. Yeah, and that's that's how I, I think, especially with these uh, SEC versus the FCS games in the week in week one, you just kind of look at the score and you – it's more or less if they don't do that, you learn something about them. I think we said this entering the UAPB game. We said, you know, Arkansas just needs to have a dominant victory and, like, a win is leaving no glaring issues as a win. Two, two thoughts about that. You know, a lot of times you'll have SEC-FCS games that actually end up being somewhat competitive. I mean, Arkansas had the Missouri State game that we've mentioned a number of times uh, two years ago. There weren't any of those. I mean, I mean, mm-hmm. it, it was none of these games were even close. They were all over by halftime. I think four of these games, the score was somewhere between 45 nothing and 52 to nothing at halftime. So uh, that's number one. Number two, I don't know that I remember this many FCS games to start the season, and so – you, know, you give an SEC team however many weeks to prepare for a team that's that's nowhere near its caliber. You know, maybe this is the result that you get. It may be, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I've just had my piece about FCS games. I won't go there again. But you know, it wasn't just those games. Western Kentucky, who I think has a, a decent program, mm-hmm. they got blown out in Tuscaloosa. They had a couple of votes. To nothing. You know, Liberty was the uh, New Year Six representative mm-hmm. last year. They had a couple of votes to dethrone Liberty in Conference USA. Colorado State they lose fifty two to nothing in Austin against Texas. Uh, it was just a really weird week, I think, in SEC football. You mentioned South Carolina's close call. Yeah, that team. I, I watched. Uh, I don't know a little bit of that game. We well, doesn't look like they can block very well. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, Rocket Sanders, he he had some. He had a big run in that game. He also had a lot of runs where he was met at the line of scrimmage and, and behind. Uh, I, I wonder about South Carolina. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I wrote something the other day that every year there is an SEC team that comes out of nowhere, seemingly, and has a big bounce back season. It was Arkansas in 2021. They went from three wins to nine wins. It was LSU the next year. They improved their win total, I think, by four. Last year was Missouri. Who's it going to be this year? Well, I don't think it's Florida, and I don't think it's South Carolina based on week one, you think about the other teams with losing records last year, I don't know that we found out enough about Arkansas, Auburn, or Mississippi State to, to really make an informed opinion on those teams. Uh, and then Vanderbilt, I mean, they, they, I guess they had kind of the win of the weekend other than Georgia over Clemson uh, beating Virginia Tech at home. They don't have to go as far to have a big turnaround. They only won two games last year, and they're already halfway there. Yeah, I think that – those week one games you're more or less you just want to be in that company of teams that you didn't like I remember whenever Arkansas and the Chad Morris era opened up with Portland State one year oh yeah you knew after that game how that season was going to go that was another close one 20 to 13 yeah and I figure that's probably how South Carolina fans are feeling right now I mean they got to play Kentucky this week and depending on how that game goes I'd (laughs) you know you might be starting you know 
how we're saying that Billy Napier is feeling it in Florida. I wouldn't be surprised mm. if Shane Beamer doesn't start feeling that in South Carolina. That's an interesting point. We want to tell you about wholehogsports.com. You can get all your latest breaking news there. Uh, we've got analysis, features, recruiting updates. Uh, we think it's the most in-depth source for all of your Arkansas sports. You can subscribe today at wholehogsports.com. Uh, do we want to get into this direct TV thing here real quick? <laughs> I think we should. Uh, let's just talk about it. So Arkansas plays Oklahoma State on Saturday at 11 a.m. It's going to be on ABC. By the way, I want to tell you that Pat Jones, the former Oklahoma State head coach, is going to be joining us a little bit later. Uh, Pat played for the Razorbacks in the 60s, was a head coach at Oklahoma State. He's been an assistant coach on both sides of the series, so we're looking forward to talking to him a little bit later on the show. ABC obviously has, has got a Disney affiliation, and you know ABC Sports went away years and years ago, and what they do is that they basically they just <clears throat> they simulcast ESPN events on ABC. And so there's a lot of uh, confusion, I think, that's out there about whether or not, if you're a direct TV customer, about whether or not you're going to get to see the Razorback game on ABC on Saturday. So I checked into this yesterday, and, and basically what I found out is that if you are a direct TV satellite customer, and that's an important distinction, and I'll tell you why in just a minute, but if you're a direct TV satellite customer, uh, you should be able to watch the Arkansas-Oklahoma State game on ABC so long as you are in a market where the ABC affiliate is not owned by Disney. Okay, so uh, Disney owns some of the major ABC affiliates in markets like New York, San Francisco, Philadelphia, Houston, Los Angeles, Chicago, a couple of other you know uh, smaller markets, Raleigh, North Carolina, Fresno, California. If you're not in one of those markets, you should be okay to watch the Arkansas game on ABC on Saturday if you are a satellite subscriber. If you su if you subscribe to DirecTV Stream, I don't believe you're going to be able to see this game on ABC on Saturday. And I know a lot of people, they say, <clears throat> when, when they have these carriage disputes, well, just switch to YouTube TV. Just switch to Hulu. Mm -hmm. You know, they've got it. And they do. But I also think that sometimes that line of thinking it comes without the understanding that, hey, at some point Hulu is going to have a carriage dispute. YouTube TV is going to have carriage disputes. They've already had one a couple of years ago, I believe, with Disney. Um, nobody's immune to this. You know what I mean? And doesn't it feel to you like more often than not, I, I mean, who is the culprit of these carriage disputes? I'd say Disney. It's Disney. <laughs> I mean, it, they're, they're the ones that you all. Last year, they had a huge carriage dispute with Spectrum which is the number two cable provider in America. And they were off the air for like 12 days. And they got it figured out like hours before the first Monday night football game of the year. Just uh, by the way, the first Monday night football game this year is next Monday between the Jets and the 49ers. So that'll be interesting to see if maybe ESPN and DirecTV have a similar resolution uh, to this uh, by the time Monday night football starts next week. It does make me wonder – if college football is going to be blacked out on DirecTV for the most part this weekend on the ESPN networks, I think uh, there's yeah. a, a decent chance that happens. And say something, and then I, w I want to tell you why I think this could go on a little while. Yeah. It seems to me, just from I haven't read as much as you on this, but it kind of reminds me of what we were the discussion we had a few weeks ago about this, you know, um, casino rule about um, you know the the raffling mm -hmm. tickets and how it really kind of the Razorbacks and sports in general were kind of being used as a way to um, maybe accelerate discussion on it or it's kind of the same way with it feels like to me with football with this carriage dispute it's like find something that people are really they really care about oh. and you get results a lot faster there it is no coincidence that they set these um, contracts to end at the end of August early September yeah. No coincidence at all. Uh, Disney knows what they're doing yeah. when, when it comes to this. It just kind of reminded me of that s a similar <laughs> thing of just as far as the moment that it affects people's sports, mm -hmm. you're going to get some attention. I actually think DirecTV, there, there is some principle in what DirecTV is saying about how Disney is basically charging users for the same content multiple times. And I believe that these providers, whether it be DirecTV or Spectrum or YouTube TV, maybe Dish, if they have something, they're trying to go to bat for their subscribers and saying, hey, look, we're trying to keep these fees down. But the networks, they're the ones that kind of have all the cards because 
people don't want to take time for nuanced discussion. They don't want to take time necessarily to stand on principle. They want immediate results. Mm-hmm. Hey, I want to be able to watch USC LSU. I want to be able to watch Florida State and Boston College. And I can't right now, so I'm dropping you and I'm going over here to this guy until this guy has a carriage dispute and I'll go to this guy. And it, it's just – and but what ends up happening – is because there's never time for these conversations and for people to stand on principle that you get five years down the line and look at your cable, satellite, streaming bill, whatever you use now, and look at it five years ago. Mm-hmm. And because nobody, ever, because everybody was so quick to jump to you know, whatever could show them the, the game, nothing was ever really done about what the provider was, was trying to argue for them in the first place. Yeah, and it seems like Disney knows what it's kind of <clears throat> doing here. Um, I mean, it's... Like you said, it's there's one common denominator with a lot of these carriage disputes, <laughs> and I think that's pretty telling. We're talking to Steve Dittmore tomorrow, by the way. He has uh, studied these carriage disputes for a number of years, former University of Arkansas sport management professor. Uh, looking forward to, to talking to him. Uh, on this DirecTV deal, though, you remember DirecTV had a, a – uh, they, they had a fight with Nexstar last year, and the local Nexstar affiliates were off of DirecTV for a long time. I think it was like three months. Mm-hmm. During the summer into football season, I think maybe there was a week, two weeks where if you were, uh, you know, trying, say like locally, if you wanted to watch Sunday night football, you couldn't watch it because the NBC affiliate here is a next star. Uh, you couldn't watch Fox because the NBC affiliate or the, the Fox here is a, a next star. So DirecTV, they've been willing to go to the mat before. Mm-hmm. And the words that DirecTV, is using in its uh, its statement about this. These are not finely crafted PR words that you hear a lot of times. Uh, these are words from an, an executive who is really mad, it feels like, about what's going on with Disney. This is from, um, who is this? This is Chief Content Officer Rob Thune. I just want to read you a, a few of the words that he said. He says, quote, The Walt Disney Company is once again refusing any accountability to consumers, distribution partners, and now the American judicial system. We'll stop right there and say ESPN right now, they're in a legal fight as they and Fox and Warner Brothers, they try to launch this new venue sports app. Um, it's been blocked by a federal judge over antitrust laws. DirecTV claims that Disney, uh, under any type of extension in, in this contract negotiation, wanted DirecTV to drop any anti-competitive claims against Disney, and I think that's a, a sticking point for DirecTV. Continue this quote, Disney is in the business of creating alternate realities, but this is the real world where we believe you earn your way and must answer for your own actions. They want to continue to chase maximum profits, dominate control at the expenses of consumers, making it harder for them to select the shows and sports they want at a reasonable price. Uh, he goes on to say consumer frustrations at an all-time high. Uh, they're, they're moving games to direct consumer services, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but here's the mic drop moment on this, uh, this quote, Ethan. He says, Disney's only magic is forcing prices to go up while simultaneously making its content disappear. He patted himself on the back (laughs) after that. I mean, this guy, this came from a place of anger. Yeah. This, this, this uh, statement from DirecTV's uh, chief content officer. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Wow. That doesn't sound like DirecTV and Disney are close. No. It's, (laughs) does it? (laughs) No. I mean, I don't think he's going to Disney World anytime soon. I don't believe so. I'm going to have to turn in his Mickey Mouse ears. Yeah. All right. We're off and running. Uh, we've got some more to get to. We'll talk about what Sam Pittman had to say. Also kind of a funny moment from uh, Mike Gundy during his press conference previewing Arkansas yesterday. In 1928, Arkansas won a game 73 to nothing, but what was that game? There's been a little bit of confusion about that. We'll talk to you about that in just a moment, but first a word from our sponsors. LPGA Week in Northwest Arkansas returns September 23rd through the 29th for the 18th consecutive year. Watch former Razorbacks and 2024 Olympians Maria Fossey and Gabby Lopez compete against the world's best female golfers at the Walmart Northwest Arkansas Championship, presented by P&G at Pinnacle Country Club in Rogers. The NWA Championship is so much more than a golf tournament, with something for everyone to enjoy and activities for fans of all ages. Daily tickets are only $10, and kids 17 and under get in free with a ticketed adult. Get your tickets today at nwachampionship.com. At Kendall King, we're proud of over four decades of design. We're continuing the legacy of great creative design by combining our brands of Kendall King, Soapbox, and Shopcart. Together, these brands represent a new focus in marketing design with individual attention to specific areas. Through our design expertise supported by a team of talented professionals, we showcase our best. 
We are Kindle King. We are Soapbox. We are Shopcart. We are Design. And we're back. Uh, Arkansas coach Sam Pittman previewed Arkansas's game against Oklahoma State on Saturday. As we mentioned, it's an 11 a.m. kickoff on ABC. The Razorbacks are 1-0. The Cowboys are 1-0. Both teams beat FCS teams during week one. But, I mean, not the same quality FCS opponents. Arkansas, they could have played their threes and beaten UAPB pretty handily. Oklahoma State played uh, South Dakota State, who won the national championship the last two years at the FCS level. Uh, Sam Pittman spoke, as we said yesterday. I want to play a couple of, of sound bites from that press conference. The first one just talks about the type of physical game that he expects Saturday in Stillwater. Again, I think this game, more than surprising somebody or a schematics, I think this is going to be a – you're going to have to go whip somebody and and uh, uh, physically to win. So I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of mistakes. I just think there's going to be a slobber knocker a little bit. I love the slobber knocker reference from Sam Pittman there. Yeah, no, it was uh, – I think it's one of those words that you – haven't heard in a while it's like i've mm-hmm. i heard that word growing up with, with football but it's like <laughs> sam P- Pittman pulled that one out of the you know decade ago pocket like if you were if you were to describe a slobber knocker it's just it's offensive and defensive line just going at it all game it's what houston nut would call a two chin strap game <laughs> yeah, yeah. Got buckle ball chin straps yeah i about to say it's the type of game that you expect a lot of running arkansas going to stillwater you know they're the first team from the sec that's gone over to Boone Pickens Stadium since 2009. Georgia was the last one who went over there. Uh, Mark Rick took a team there. They lost. I believe that game had a couple of really great receivers. I think uh, it was either Des Bryant or Justin Blackman, Blackman. on that Oklahoma State team. Mm-hmm. And then uh, uh, Georgia had – It was an A.J. Green. A.J. Green, yep. yes. You saved me there because I couldn't yeah. remember his first name. I knew it was Green. <laughs> yeah. A.J. Green, who had a great career uh, with the Bengals. And uh, Oklahoma State won that game. You know, Mike Gundy is 5-5 five and five against SEC teams since he took over. He's beaten Georgia, uh, as we said, when Mark Richt was there. Uh, he beat Alabama. That was pre-save, and that was the game where Joe Kynes had the great uh, <laughs> the great halftime interview going off the field as Alabama's interim coach down at the, uh, at the Independence Bowl in Shreveport. Uh, but they've beaten Missouri. They beat Texas A&M last year in a bowl game. They've beaten Mississippi State. They have come close, I think, in a couple of other games against SEC teams. Uh, it's it's not an SEC program, and we'll hear Mike Gundy talk about this here in just a minute. You know, they don't have the type of SEC lineman or the type of lineman that you see in the SEC. Uh, but, man, I think they got a capable team that's that's dangerous of picking off anybody, especially when you get them on your home field. Yeah, I mean, just ask Oklahoma. I feel like in recent years that's been, you know, mm-hmm. just their downfall. Well, it's, it's a tough game. You know, Oak, yeah. What's interesting is Gundy's only beaten Oklahoma four times. Mm-hmm. They've only won Bedlam four times, but they give them a lot of a lot of trouble. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of heartbreak in that Bedlam series yep. uh, that, unfortunately, is going away because Oklahoma is now in the SEC. So Boone Pickens, you know, Arkansas hasn't played there in many years. I think it was the 1974-75 season, somewhere in there, the last time Arkansas played over in Stillwater. Uh, if you haven't watched games there, and I know a lot of the people who are, are listening or watching us, uh, you watch Arkansas's games, and maybe you only watch other SEC games, or you only watch other big games, and maybe Oklahoma State flies under your radar sometimes. The the sidelines there are extremely narrow, probably the narrowest point from, say, like the, the start of the sideline to the wall in all of college football. And Sam Pittman, he's coached there in Bedlam. He was an assistant coach at OU back in the 1990s, and he spoke about that yesterday. Very, very loud, uh, very, very close, as in they can stand up and look right on top of you. And we've talked to our coaching staff and our players about that well because we can't let their fans be a distraction to us when we're trying to learn on the sidelines, trying to talk about the next series, whatever it may be. So that's Sam Pittman talking about the the closeness of the sidelines there at Boone Pickens Stadium. These are just the little things that, a coach is going to notice and players are going to notice. There are little things that I don't know that the, the, the common fan really takes into consideration going into a game like this. No, and they impact you. I mean, the, the last thing you want is your players to, like, 
Sam said, you know, let the fans get to their head. Because, I mean, you know, at a college football game, the things that get yelled at these players is crazy. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it gets to them. I remember um, as a student, that Texas game, um, there were definitely a lot of things said to those Texas players, and it got to them that night. (laughs) And it was... (laughs) It's just, you know, you just want your team, I guess, if you're a coach, you know, whenever you go into a place like that, probably to just tune it all out. I'm excited to go over to Stillwater on Saturday. There, there's, I don't know, there's something about going to a venue, an environment, a setting that you've never been in before. I've been to Oklahoma State for other games. that covered many, many baseball games over there. Hey, look, this football game is going to have a tough time living up to the last time I was in Stillwater. I was there for the 22 uh, baseball regional. That was just absolutely insane. Uh, but I'm always excited to go into these new settings and, and new venues like this. And hey, this is this is cool for us because, it, like we said, it's been 50 years since Arkansas has been there. Yeah, and it's it's one of those places that, you know, it's great for regional – like it's a regional game where fans, it's not going to be hard for them to make it. I mean, it's still going to – not expecting there to just be like a sea of red there because Oklahoma State has such a passionate fan base. Mm-hmm. You know that they're going to have a lot of fans there. Um, but it is going to be cool that it is a trip that a lot of people can make. Arkansas is 13-7 and seven against Big 12 teams since that conference formed in 1996. They've had a lot of success in these types of games, and, and that also includes games against Missouri before they moved to the SEC or Texas or Oklahoma uh, or uh, – whom I'm missing, A and M, you know, A&M. before they came over to the SEC. Uh, Mike Gundy, and, and well, let me let me preface this: it feels like line play is always a huge difference. Arkansas, they may not match up to the other SEC teams, but then when you see them go out of conference, their line, it, a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times, uh, th- there's a a significant difference there. And Mike Gundy referenced that yesterday during his news conference. When you play a team in the SEC, you're going to play girth. You're going to play massive guys that have a lot of size and they're physical in the box and um, you know they have a a really good geographical location for producing bigger tight bodies like that (laughs) and so um, that's where I mentioned that we we need to make good strides between last week and this week uh, in order to block a completely different front than, than what we saw last week. Uh, they've got a good geographical location for big people. That's what Mike Gundy <laughs> that says. That was hilarious. I can't believe he said that. I mean, like really? he said it so politely, though. That like, like you have to think back about it. Like, did he say what I think he said? Yeah, I mean, it's a geographical location. I mean, it's not like <laughs> Oklahoma's across the world, but he's acting like you know Arkansas is just in prime territory to produce big people. Like, what on earth? Just a couple hundred miles away from Stillwater, if even that. I mean, it's yeah. once you get to Tulsa, you're you're an hour from Stillwater. And uh, Arkansas is going to play over there on Saturday morning. We've got plenty more about Arkansas and Oklahoma State at our website, wholehogsports.com. Ethan, what were some of the other things that Sam said that stood out to you yesterday? Um, most notable, as far as, like, I guess it's probably good to always update on injury. Um, Andrew Armstrong is <clears throat> questionable um, again. So if they're without him, that's a that's a blow. He's, you know, when he's healthy, kind of the alpha dog of the receiver room um you know they Patrick Kudis is doubtful again so Amarion Harris probably gonna see him at um left guard again and then uh Miguel Mitchell is out for the game no reason given there but those are kind of the personnel notes that Sam uh gave yesterday that's okay. kind of the what stood out to me aside from what all we've already mm-hmm. talked about Okay, I, I want to get in, and like I said, we can you can read more of Ethan's work at wholehogsports.com. We're going to spend all week looking forward to Arkansas and Oklahoma State. I wanted to to address something real quick. So I know that the people have probably noticed that in some stories over the last week, it has said that Arkansas, uh, well, in all stories, it says that Arkansas had its largest win since 1928, and that is true. They won a game in 1928, 73 to nothing. Uh, it kind of came to our attention yesterday that some people were saying it was against one team, some people were saying it was against the other. So we went uh, through the archives trying to find out, was it Texas Southwestern or was it Rhodes College who Arkansas beat 73 to nothing in 1928? Because there's a big difference between those two. Texas Southwestern University, assuming it exists, I don't know if it does exist, but assuming it exists, that is a long way from – Rhodes College is in Memphis. Mm-hmm. So which one was it? So 
what happened from best we can tell and and, and why this was even a uh, a point of confusion was that uh, the Arkansas media guide on one page, like in their year by year results in 1928, said that they had beaten Rhodes College. But on another page within the media guide where it talks about the most points scored, some of the largest wins, things like that, uh, it mentions Texas Southwestern. Best we can tell is that Arkansas beat Rhodes College in 1928. It used to be called Southwestern Presbyterian University. Some people called it Southwestern University. And so probably what happened is that somewhere along the line in the transfer of records, somebody either miswrote Tennessee Southwestern as Texas Southwestern or someone misinterpreted Texas or Tennessee Southwestern as Texas Southwestern. And then, you know, the media guides, they're not perfect. And they're always, you know, to the, to the credit of the communications professionals uh, that, that handle those and, and produce those every year, they're always looking for these mistakes and, and trying to correct them and, and make those media guides as perfect as they can. So the way we found this, though, is that uh, we went through the, uh, the archives. We found the Arkansas Gazette from November 30th, 1928, with a Memphis dateline when Arkansas beat Southwestern University. And because nobody writes like this anymore, Ethan, I just wanted to, uh, to read a little bit of this football game story oh, because it's, it is a, it's an absolute doozy. <laughs> it looks like something that you would read from you know, Grantland Rice in Sports Illustrated back in the day. And I asked Blake to find us some football music to play underneath this. I guess I will be playing the part of uh, uh, John Facinda here, even though I don't have John Facinda's voice. But I want to read you a little bit of, best of, of this, Blake. Ah. <laughs> I'm ready. This sounds like playing in the mud, <laughs> doesn't it, in 1928? Against uh, Rhodes and Southwestern. We think it was Rhodes. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right, this is how it was read in the Arkansas Gazette. Relentlessly pushing touchdown after touchdown before it, in monotonous regularity, a steamroller, disguised as a University of Arkansas football team, rumbled on Ferguson Field today and crushed the defending Southwestern University 11 under a 73 to nothing defeat before a rainy day crowd of about 5,000. That was the first paragraph. <laughs> Second paragraph, slow in starting, the Razorback juggernaut collected its strength in the second quarter to count a pair of touchdowns and rolled up nine more before time cut them down in the act of making another. In a bewildering exhibition of every kind of football conceivable, from straight line plunging to grabbing wild passes, the representatives from the state across the river showed that they have one powerful football team. <laughs> That's wow. the Arkansas Gazette from November 30th, 1928. Uh, <laughs> they also wrote that Arkansas had, quote, an orgy of scoring. We don't write like that oh, anymore. Goodness. We have a family newspaper. I don't think they would allow that in there. Uh, but this is great. This is great uh, writing. I, I don't know. It, really, what I took away from this is that they didn't score on every possession, like Arkansas <laughs> did against UAPB. Yeah, no. That's uh, that's hilarious, though. I mean, just, I don't know if, uh, if Bob Holt has that type of writing in him or something. but Bobby Petrino was not <laughs> coordinating this team because it says they were – trying to score more before time cut them down and making in yeah. the act of making another time doesn't cut that man down <laughs> no Arkansas had a couple of last minute touchdowns against UAPB what was it nine seconds and 36 seconds yeah are they upset in Pine Bluff about Arkansas scoring the last touchdown perhaps I don't know uh it's a third it's Arkansas's third stringers let them not let them get some run look man they 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 took 10 minutes off the game they could have beat you by a hundred <laughs> yeah don't get let's, mad. let's not get mad about losing by 70 when you could have lost by 90. Yeah, I mean, that the third Arkansas's third team already was losing five minutes of each quarter to get to play, so let them try and put together a touchdown drive. Ethan, thank you for being here. Yep. When we come back, we're going to talk with Pat Jones, the former Oklahoma State football coach, former Razorback football player, but first another word from our sponsors. Taste, sip, sample, and discover the very best restaurants and chefs Northwest Arkansas has to offer at the Bite Experience at the LPGA. A unique culinary experience on site at the Northwest Arkansas Championship. Tickets are available Friday, September 27th through Sunday, September 29th, offering access to the best golf viewing and food and beverage samples from over 30 local restaurants. You don't want to miss this. Tickets are available for $45 a day. Get yours before they sell out at BiteNWA.com. At Kendall King, we're proud of over four decades of design. We're continuing the legacy of great creative design by combining our brands of Kindle King, Soapbox, and Shopcart. 
Together, these brands represent a new focus in marketing design with individual attention to specific areas. Through our design expertise supported by a team of talented professionals, we showcase our best. We are Kindle King, we are Soapbox, we are Shopcart, we are Design. And hey, welcome back. I want to tell you about Bentonville Glass, serving its community since 1971, committed, professional, and versatile. If you're looking for a quality leader in Northwest Arkansas or looking for skilled craftsmanship, look no further than Bentonville Glass. For all your glass market needs with the highest quality products, come by and see us at 507 South Main in Bentonville or online at bentonvilleglass.com. Uh, we're happy to be joined now by Pat Jones. He's the former football coach at Oklahoma State, grew up in Little Rock, Host the Pat Jones Show over in Tulsa and Oklahoma City. And, uh, Coach, I didn't think anybody – you're the first person I thought of when I thought, you know, <laughs> who to talk to about Arkansas and Oklahoma State. Who better? You you were a Razorback. Uh, you coached at Oklahoma State for a lot of years. This has got to be kind of a fun matchup, I would think, for you. Well, it's going to be interesting, Matt, to say the least. I've I've, I've coached on both sides of this mm-hmm. deal, you know, and, and uh, uh, you know, and, and – and, of course, I coached and started coaching in the late '60s at, at Little Rock Hall, where, <clears throat> excuse me, where I I played and everything, and then I go up to a, a Fayetteville in '74 and '75, and uh, you know, and then in Oklahoma, we go to Oklahoma State '79, '80 with Jimmy Johnson. I'm the defensive coordinator over there, and that's I think the last couple of times they played. But mm-hmm. uh, and you know, I grew up watching this series in Little Rock, and, and also. Yeah, it, it's it's very interesting, and this should be an interesting ball game. And and all, but like I say, I, I I've been on both sides of this. I mean, Oklahoma State pounded us pretty good. We when we were at Arkansas in '74 and '75, and 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 all that kind of stuff. So uh, uh, yeah, and then Holson them, <clears throat> pardon me, Holson them got us in '79 and '80. And uh, but this game's got some history, and obviously geographically it's a fit, and uh, you know. It, it's it's it should be a very very interesting ball game. Arkansas and Oklahoma State they played almost every year throughout the '50s, '60s, '70s. Why do you think it's taken so long for this to get back on each team's schedule? You know, Mr. Henry Ivo, the old time basketball coach and, and AD over there forever. You know, won national titles when he's coaching basketball and and all that was was pretty close. I was pretty close with him, and we used to talk about this years ago. And he, he used to say, "Well." I was so thankful to Coach Broyles because he financially saved us. <laughs> you know, I mean, Oklahoma State would come to Little Rock every year. Arkansas mm-hmm. wouldn't come over here. And it was it was kind of a, you know, what we sometimes call a blood game a little bit for money. Back in even when Oklahoma State was Missouri Valley before the Big Eight days, you know, and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And then and then again there in in the mid-'70s, it kind of turned around a little bit and, and all. And then uh, – but I think as, as much as any – Probably got to the point where, where Oklahoma State didn't have to come over here, come to Little Rock, you know, every every year for money. Mm-hmm. You know, they start drawing well, and they've done really nice things to facilities over there and all that kind of stuff. And so I, I you know, it, 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 but basically Arkansas wouldn't go home and home. Do you think? You know, what do you think that says about how Oklahoma State has, has grown as a program? You know, it started, I guess, with what Jimmy Johnson did. You built on that. Les Miles had a good run, and now Gundy's been there for for twenty years. You know the, the fact yeah. that hey, at one point they couldn't get Arkansas to come to Stillwater very often, and, and now this series begins over there. Well, and Jim Stanley, Oklahoma State had, had their moments before. See, Jim Stanley was over there, you know, again in in seventy three. Mm-hmm. Oklahoma State beats Arkansas thirty eight to six in seventy four. Mm-hmm. You know, it was twenty six to seven in seventy five. It was it was twenty to thirteen seventy four when when we were at Arkansas. Uh, you know, we beat Southern Cal in the opening ball game. We thought we had all the answers, and Oklahoma State came over and drilled us twenty six to seven. Mm-hmm. Seventy five was the year we won the Southwest Conference. Beat Georgia in the Cotton Bowl, and Oklahoma State beat us. That was, the, I think, the last time Arkansas has been to uh, Stillwater. And Oklahoma State wins the ball game twenty to thirteen. But yeah, really, from from there on in, and then you know it, when when it got away, and then like I say, we got over there with Jimmy in seventy nine, and then we hit the run with. Thomas and Sanders and O'Neill and those guys and all that kind of stuff and 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 Oklahoma and then you know Mike Gundy who you know would, would play quarterback for us and then we gave him his first job and elevated him to the coordinator and all this and so Mike's uh, you know probably the most prominent name in Oklahoma State football history but uh, 
uh, you know, and they've gotten where they've, they've, they've been smart and schedule smart. The, the evolution of the Big 8, Big 12 obviously factored in, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, and everything from, from all of a sudden now, now you know, Texas and OU are gone to the SEC. Nebraska, before they gave up football up there, you know, they went to the Big 10. <laughs> A&M was there. They left. So just kind of the evolution of what the from, – from Big 8 to Big 12 to what it is now – it's probably it's, it's been a factor with that, and again they 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 built built some real nice stuff facility wise and and all that. That stadium is still just a little over fifty, but they've got it ringed with suites and and they just killed them with the suite sales and everything. And they've got extremely nice office and practice facilities and all these sorts of things and and all which which has obviously all been a factor in what they've really become. So Arkansas beats UAPB seventy to nothing last Thursday. Mm-hmm. Uh, Oklahoma State beat South Dakota State, the, the two-time reigning FCS national champion, right. forty-four to twenty over the weekend. I know you watched some of both games. Based on what mm-hmm. you saw, what do you think of the matchup Saturday? I think it's going to be. Uh, I heard Mike Gundy do a presser here earlier, uh, and I think Mike's got it pegged to you know a, a bit. I think it'll be Oklahoma State speed and quickness against Arkansas has got a little bit more brute force, probably mm. a little bit bigger. Oklahoma State's quicker and faster. Um, you know, it will be interesting. I was curious to watch, and 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 obviously, I used to know those guys at UAPB, and that you know they're not very good, bless their heart, right now. But you know, the guy I was really interested in see Taylor Green, mm-hmm. you know, the quarterback from Boise. He's he's an impressive young man. I mean, even though obviously they had UAPB out, man, um, I, I was curious to see being a tall guy whether he was just a long strider or how much foot quickness he had and how much arm talent he had and his body language, which I thought was all really, really good. Petrino will certainly do a great job with him. But this kid looks like to me that if he's right, he could take over a game. You know, now what he does against the Oklahoma State defense, I don't know. But that was, to me, the most impressive thing about about watching Arkansas play was was, was Talon, Talon Green. Um you know, the, the, the Jackson, the back looks like a good player. Hard to really tell on the offensive line is, you know, they're big and strong. Mm-hmm. Uh, defensively, you know, you know, it's got some guys that can rush the passer and, and all this. Um, but, again, Oklahoma State's got Molly Gordon and, and um, Bowman, the quarterback, has been around forever. He's about 25 years old, I think, and really played well. And the thing about Oklahoma State that it that has gotten somewhat overlooked that, that, that is really impressive and showed up the other day is their receiver core. You know, they've got three or four receivers that can get it pretty good. Uh, Brandon Presley's a kick returner, smaller guy, but, you know, they try to give the ball a bunch on bubble screens and stuff, and they got a kid named Stripling that had transferred from Washington State a year ago that had gotten off to a good start and then broke a wrist. He, he came back and showed up big the other day, and Rashad Owens has been around for a while. and is, is a good player and had a kid transfer – from OU that, that's helping the receiver core. So between Bowman, the quarterback, and that and the Oklahoma State receiver core, uh, and Ollie Gordon, uh, the running back, it, it's in a veteran crew of offensive linemen. It's a pretty salted group offensively. You've seen your fair share of, of great running backs over there. Uh, Gordon won the, mm-hmm. the Doak Walker last year. How good right. is he? Matt, he's not Darren McFadden. Now, okay. he's not – and I'm not even going to get into Thomas and Sanders because <laughs> you got a bust in Canton, you know. I mean that that speaks for itself. But but um, he was and I, and I had a visit. To, uh, Clay Henry and I were visiting the other day on something, and mm-hmm. and and I made that remark, and Clay said, "Well, does he, he remind him of, of of Reggie Cobb kind of a bit?" That's probably a fairly good analogy, you know. Um, he's a he's a little bit taller guy. He's put on he's put on about five pounds. He looks a little a little thicker, not not too heavy, because he's he's a pretty sleek guy, and he's about six one or so. Um, but he's he's again he's not McFadden. He's not the, he'll probably be he'll probably be about a high third round draft choice, you know. And he's a little bit taller guy, like McFadden. But you know McFadden was a fourth player pick, so I I think that compared now this kid if you turn him loose, he'll turn the lights out on you. Gordon will, mm-hmm. and now he doesn't he doesn't have quite as much jump around as some. Although he'll break some tackles, you know you got to tackle the guy. 
He's got very good hands. Had about four catches the other day. He'll play for a long time in the NFL if he stays healthy and be a good player. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say I think he's going to have a bust in Canton, but he's a good player. Oklahoma State's got the oldest offensive line in college football. I think their average age is somewhere around 22, 23 years old, but how good are they? Mm -hmm. You know, they're not – I've used the analogy, you know, Russell O'Kung, the kid they had over there several years ago was a first-round draft choice. Mm -hmm. And these guys are not – they're not that gifted, but they're guys who have played. They're smart. They're tough. They're not little guys. You know, so it's it's – and they they don't don't tend to – Throw no hitters. Now, Mike was on him. Gundy was on him the other day. About, about, you know, felt like he could have blocked uh, South Dakota State a little bit better. But, you know, they're, they're good pass protectors. Uh, they don't, again, they tend not to throw no hitters. They're, they're going to get a hat on a hat, and they're, they're going to play hard and compete, and they're smart, and they play forever. Mm-hmm. You know, things don't, don't, things don't get to them as far as the dynamics of the game. So I'm not going to sit here and say they're, they're all a bunch of high-round draft choices, but they're – they're better than just solid college offensive linemen. Talking with Pat Jones, former Oklahoma State head coach from 1984 to 94, won 62 games in Stillwater, three 10-win seasons. Uh, you you were a practice player. Would that be accurate at Arkansas? Oh, yeah. I, well, see, I originally signed, uh, came out of it. 1964 was my senior year at Hall High, and we were fortunate enough to win a state championship i signed with arkansas tech which really was about my level of play okay you know to be honest with you and i had three teammates from that were on scholarship at Fayetteville. so i after the 65 season i transfer up there you know and, and yeah you know, basically a scout team guy I, I, I couldn't play at that level but and i i had a little bit of a ankle injury to the tail end of my freshman year so i kind of claimed lame and was fortunate enough mm-hmm. to you know the people who had coached me in in high school in little rock Ray Peters and C.W. Keppel and those guys, you know, had, had essentially said, hey, if, if we got a place down here, we'll hire you. And they did, and, and the rest of that took off. I was, you know, I was coaching the defensive and defensive coordinator at Hall High, and I was 23 years old. You know, so I was I was very, very fortunate in that regard. And then, again, I go back to Fayetteville. Coach Broyles hired me back up there in 1974, mm-hmm. originally as a graduate assistant. Then in 75, they – they gave me a title, so I was there 74, 75. SMU, Ron Meyer, Pitt, Jimmy Johnson, I got back together at Pitt down here at Oklahoma State as the defensive coordinator for Jimmy. Jimmy leaves and goes to Miami. I'm the head coach there for 10 years. After that, then, when Jimmy took the job with the Dolphins, I go down there for eight years and then two years with the Oakland Raiders, and I'd about had enough and do radio. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you one of the things I like is that you, you keep the Razorbacks relevant in Tulsa. I mean, it's such a huge alumni base for the university. You know, back in the old days, yeah. Tulsa World would cover Arkansas games. That doesn't happen anymore. Mm. KTUL, oh, yeah. they would come over. They would do – I remember sure. when I was a kid, KTUL came over and did a special on a Sunday night from, oh, yeah. from Razorback Stadium. So uh, you keep the Razorbacks relevant in Tulsa. I want to ask you about well, Mike Gundy. A, oh, go ahead. Oh, excuse me. You know, we, this, our radio station over here <laughs> has a pretty good footprint in, in – Northwest Arkansas, mm-hmm. and again, up at one time, the Tulsa World got to Northwest Arkansas before the Arkansas Gazette, you know, when it was the morning paper. So, mm-hmm. but you know, all those kinds of things. Yeah, but we've got a, and there's there's a there's a ton of Arkansas people over here. That's one of the interesting yeah. things about this particular series. I want to ask you about Mike Gundy because you coached him. Like mm-hmm. you said, you gave him his first job. Uh, mm-hmm. what, what's made him so successful? Like, how's how's he lasted for twenty years? Well, you know, Mike is—he comes out of a, of, of, a, of a great high school program, in Midwest City, that's down there by Tanker Air Force Base, mm-hmm. really Oklahoma City. But uh, uh, you know, which which a guy named Dick Evans coached him, and, and and Mike had been well coached. Ironically, the year Mike came out, Matt, when he in, and they won the state title when his senior year. See, that was the same year him, Quinn Grovey, and Charles Thompson from Walton all came out at the same time. Mm. So he was in the same class that Grovey was in. Mm-hmm. Now, in Grovey, I thought one time we might get Grovey, to be honest about it. Now, he did the right thing going over there to Arkansas because he's really an option quarterback. You know, uh, uh, Charles Thompson went to start out at OU and then had some issues. We signed Mike, you know, and, and was a high-profile high signee for us because normally those kids down there would go to OU. We get Mike and then start him after about the third game of his freshman year, and then Bamo, he he engineers the the second and third ten win seasons that 
Oklahoma State ever had back over there in 80, 87 and 88. Mm-hmm. Of course, when you're, you know, when you got Thurman Thomas and Barry Sanders lined up behind you, you know, you, <laughs> and all, but Mike is still to this day, because there is no more Big Eight, obviously. He's the all time leading passer in the history of the Big Eight, which will always stand because there's no more Big Eight. But, mm-hmm. but, uh, smart, very, his, I think his first however many attempts as a quarterback, you know, set an NCAA record for not throwing interceptions. Because I think we told him we'd kill him if he did, but you know he uh, he didn't do. I'm being facetious about that. But Mike had very good judgment, had very good people skills, Matt. And that's one thing I think it's serving him extremely well going forward. Here we noticed it when he was a true freshman. Again, we had Barry Sanders and Thurman Thomas and Hartley Dykes and you know a, a bunch of guys that were really, really you know big time players. And Mike fit in well and and you know related to them and. Body language was good. He's a smart guy. He studied the game. Sunday mornings uh, when he was playing, you know, he might be the first one to knock on the door with one of his buddies to get in there and go watch film. You know, um, Mm -hmm. excellent student of the game. Really, you know, highly competitive, excellent leadership qualities, all the things that we think. And we thought we saw that, and we actually hired him full-time as a – we had lost Mm -hmm. a a couple of coaches, and we – we moved him up actually before he had graduated. He had to get a ruling to do it. Actually made him a varsity receiver coach, put him on the road recruiting, and then moved him up again as a as a coordinator and all these kinds of things. And, you know, the rest, he goes to Baylor a little bit and goes to Maryland a little bit. And Mam gets back over there, and then then here you go. Um, Terry Don Phillips actually wanted to hire him as a as the head coach back before, to be honest about it, when mm-hmm. Terry Don was the AD there, you know, so – but I, I think, I, you know, it's no surprise to anybody that Mike has accomplished what he's done. I wanted to ask you about Boone Pickens Stadium because it's different than the mm-hmm. last time Arkansas played over there, obviously. Right. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. About 53,000, 54,000 seats, I think. Uh, but, but you know, the thing I always hear about Boone Pickens is that it's loud. And I think about War Memorial. Well, you know, War Memorial doesn't have yeah. to be very big, but it can be loud. Austin Stadium at Oregon, not real big, but it's, it's one of the loud yeah. places. What's a game day well, look like there? Well, it's it's now that stadium before you know for for big ball games because the you know the one one end was 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 where the scoreboard is now is or was excuse me my directions are still off over there <laughs> was was had had bleachers in it but it was kind of open mm-hmm. now actually they dropped the attendance just a little bit from fifty six six to about I don't know fifty one something but okay. the thing they've done such a good job of man is is and you'll see it when you get there. That whole thing is is ringed with 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 uh, boxes. Mm-hmm. I mean, the the whole stadium essentially is, and and now they got a massive scoreboard at one end, but but it's 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 closed in. It's a it's a very the, the field is is close to the stands. You know, the people are right on top of you. Now they've just renovated some stuff and some seating areas. Quite honestly, I haven't even seen, but they just just got that done here not too long ago. Uh, and, and again, their boxes have just, they killed them with the boxes and it's, it's, and again, their, their, their office complex is in there and their practice facilities are across the street and, and the whole thing. So it's really a, I mean, it's, it's, it's like you're down in a hole a bit and it, it does, it'll, it'll get really loud. Students always have been very active in the whole thing and sound kind of gets trapped down in there, wind swirls around, but. It's a it's a very intense atmosphere, and I assure you it will be when for, for the Razorbacks to come there. Reminds me a little bit of Razorback Stadium, maybe without the upper decks on on the sides, at least you know visually yeah, from that, the outside. Yeah, that part of it, I was, I was, uh, you know, because I, gosh, man, I I grew up before they even had stands in the north end end zone <laughs> in in Warmore Stadium. I was in the crew that played games with the paper cups sliding down the hill. Now that's before <laughs> your days, obviously. <laughs> I can remember watching. Switzer and those guys warm up through the chain link fence, you know, and all these kinds of things. But, mm-hmm. you know, going way, way, way back. But, you know, and I guess maybe the, are they going to turn the air conditioning on maybe next year in the press box? Wasn't that an issue uh, the other if, day if, or something? The, 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 the uh, air conditioning and the plumbing both were, were plumbing, issues. Plumbing, I, it's I always, read that. Well, it's always something yeah. in Little Rock, it feels like. Well, hey. it's, and that just, you know, with all the money they've spent in Fayetteville, I can see – you know, on, on the facilities and everything, I'm moving stuff out of mm-hmm. out of Little Rock. But you know, in, in me growing up and obviously the '50s and, and '60s down there, I mean, that was, you know, that was that was what you did. That was the happening. Yeah. You know, come to the capital city and go see the racetrack play. Of course, I can remember going out there too, Matt, way back, and 
you could basically go out there on the center and sit about anywhere you wanted to, too, now. It feels and like then it. here came Coach Royals, and here came the big winning, and here came the expansion in War Memorial and all these kinds of things. That's when Fayetteville held, what, 39,000 or mm-hmm. something. But it's, uh, I, yeah, I read those things, and I kind of hate to hear it, knowing what, what at one time War Memorial Stadium was and what it was perceived as. But that stuff in Fayetteville is very nice, obviously. Yeah, it's kind of kind of sad. Uh, people who, who know is. the history of it War is. Memorial, but it seems like it the, the writing's on the wall. Maybe it's days are numbered. Hey, I know we're going a little long. i got two more for you real quick if you sorry, got time. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That's Le- all right. Leslie O'Neill is going to be inducted into the yeah. uh, Ring of Honor uh, in Stillwater on mm-hmm. Saturday. Obviously one of your great players. Had a great career with the Chargers in the NFL. Uh, from Little Rock Hall, like you, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. d- did you have to out-recruit Arkansas, or did they want him? Well, you know, he wasn't going to go to Arkansas. They tried to get him, and I don't want to get into that, Steve. I mean, what was his, you know, but he had he had some reasons. He, okay. he, he, did, he wasn't going to go to Arkansas. He wasn't going to. It, it came down. Butch Davis recruited him and signed him. Butch, but did a great job with him on getting him. I had actually, we'd coached his older brother, Leonard, down there when I was coaching at Hall. Now, he was kind of a journeyman lineman, but pretty mm-hmm. good athlete and everything, but Leslie, if I remember right, Matt, it boiled down to UCLA. Somehow Mississippi State had gotten involved in it, but it boiled down to Oklahoma State and UCLA on him. I mean, he had options to go about wherever he wanted to. Now, he just he wasn't going to go to Fayetteville. He just he wasn't going to go there. Okay. Uh, and, you know, and we were fortunate enough to get him and, and the whole thing. And, you know, we, we didn't really know what to do with him in 81. And I'm sorry, in 82, his freshman year, 83 – uh, uh, I'd gone back to coaching as a defensive coordinator, and that was, he's as a true sophomore, and, and that was a really good defensive group. It went as year we went to Blue Bonnet Bowl and beat Baylor and all that kind of stuff. And then '84 and '85, when I become the head coach, you know, I'm, I mean, Leslie, really, really, I guess, and in, in, you know, Matt, in the, in, in the decade of of the, of the '80s, and all of us out there doodling around this morning on this, if if you had a four man rush. And, and it was third and seven, and you had to get somebody on the ground. Bruce Smith, Reggie White, Lawrence Taylor, O'Neill. Hmm. That's that would have been that would have probably been the four best pass rushers. I know Lawrence Taylor only was senior to eighty, but the, as far as that would have been the probably the top four pass rushers in the decade of the eighties in in college football. And then Leslie, see, I think he and Lawrence Taylor are tied for sacks in the NFL. He was you know sleek and quick and could run and smart and you know, tough and, and the whole deal and, and truly a great player. He's, you know, uh, Thomas and Sanders are, has got their name on there. Terry Miller went in a year ago, the, the great running back. And Bob Fenimore, who comes from other eras. Fenimore was, you know, back in the, when they had a, they had a team back in the 40s that won a version of the national title. And Fenimore was a, was a great two-way player. But O'Neill will join them in their ring of honor. They've been very – that's a very select group, mm-hmm. you know. So that's going to – that's going to take place Saturday, and obviously well deserved. And and I'm looking forward to seeing Leslie and, and the whole deal. And yeah, Little Rock Hall, man. Yes. Yep. And I wanted to ask you too. Uh, we didn't get a chance mm-hmm. to react to this last week, but Billy Moore passed away, the first All America quarterback. Gonna, yes. At Arkansas, you Thank saw him you. play. I was, you, you, I mean, you grew oh, up just yeah. a little bit after him in Little Rock, but you saw him play. Yeah. For people who didn't see him play, how, how would you describe him? Tough. Uh, I was going to uh, thank you for reminding me. I'd written that down to give condolences to, to the family. And of course, Henry Moore's brother played before Billy. Mm-hmm. Henry was a good player, mm-hmm. but I can remember them playing for, for coach Matthews and the, and the little rock tigers and, and all that. You know, when I was growing up before they built hall, you know, you, and, and they little rock, the little rock high at the time was winning a zillion games and getting coach Matthews stuff. And Billy would have been, Billy would have been probably a, Oh, let me see who you might compare him to. Uh, uh, he he's kind of a Lamar Jackson. Mm. Think think about Lamar Jackson in the NFL, a scaled down version of Lamar Jackson, run pass guy. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was sprint pass and play action. I mean, he led him in rushing. Tough guy, tough. You know, just a. Uh, uh, um, I mean, he he was a. I mean, he's what still the only All American quarterback in the history of the University of Arkansas, isn't he? First teamer. I, I, Believe that might be right. I'm not 100 percent sure. I know I, he was their I, first. I, I, I think he's. I think was the first, and I think the last first teamer quarterback mm. at the University of Arkansas. Again, you know, bounced around and played in Canada a little bit and the whole deal. But I, I you know, I, I think of a, a scaled down version 
of Lamar Jackson is kind of what what Billy Moore was, but heck of a guy. And, and I, well, in fact, I can I, I texted Jimmy Johnson. Jimmy said to send his condolences to the Moore family because Jimmy Jimmy C was a sophomore when Billy was a senior mm-hmm. playing up there, and and you know they knew each other pretty well. And I I texted Jimmy the other day when I got word to Billy passed away. I knew he wasn't in very good health and mm-hmm. used to see him out there at Pleasant Valley quite a bit, but. Uh, from standpoint, yeah, heck of a player and, and, and meant an awful lot to the, the tradition of football at the University of Arkansas. I mean, just to speak to his running ability, what, what you were talking about when Broderick Green had that 99 yard yeah. touchdown run about a decade or so ago, it broke yeah. a record that Billy Moore had held for almost 40 years. He had oh, yeah. a 90 yard touchdown yeah. run against Tulsa yeah. Yeah. in his uh, senior year. He could get it, he could get it pretty good. And he wasn't quite Michael Vick, but like I say, if you envision what Lamar Jackson looks like running around up there, maybe scale down a little bit of a notch, just, you know, just just a little. Now you got Billy Moore. Coach, we appreciate your time and uh, really appreciate your time, and uh, hope you enjoy uh, watching watching these teams play on Saturday afternoon. Matt, thank you. My pleasure. Y'all have a good week. Okay, you too. Appreciate it, Coach Pat Jones, of uh, former coach at Oklahoma State, former Razorback football player. We appreciate him. We appreciate you being with us today on our podcast. Hope you come to our website, wholehogsports.com, throughout the week to see all of our coverage leading up to the Razorbacks and the Cowboys on Saturday. We'll be back with another podcast tomorrow. We'll see you then.